Well, so welcome everyone again this morning, and especially people who might be listening online or listening to the podcast. So really good to have you on board this morning. Um, well, this morning I want to talk about what doors are, is God opening up to you, or what doors are opening up to you, because not every door that opens ahead of us is a door that we should go through. So we need, need clear instructions, fresh directions from the Holy Spirit on what to do, just like we heard prophetically, lean not under your, into your own understanding, you know, because it's so easy just to go with the flow and um, we have to be wise. Um, so our choices are very, very important in what we, we do every day, um, you know, critical decisions. And we've just been through Easter and I reckon the greatest door in humanity, the greatest day in history was when the tomb had its door rolled open, um, the stone was rolled away the good. It was never rolled back. It was open. And obviously the Son of Man had come come back to life and he was liberated from the grave. But as we look back, we see Satan, we know in a Reader's Digest version, he was cast out of heaven because he eluded a third of the angels. He usurped God's authority, so he was kicked out of um, heaven. He was expelled into the heart of the earth. But Satan was still a deceiver and he deceived Eve and obviously the domino effect was um, Adam's uh, perception and, and sin and entered into the world. And the enemy hasn't given up. He's still deceiving people. He's trying to um, con people. And so we've got to make clear choices in what we do and how we react. Um, but Easter was the greatest day in history. Um, and we just have to understand that the doors of opportunity are still ahead of us in the face of adversity. So making a choice that is clear in our life is always going to help us. Um, there was another door, and that was on the side of the ark, where Noah was um, begging people to come into the sanctuary of God, a place that was set apart. But sadly, we know the story. It was only a handful of people that got redemption, and most people were swept away with the ways of the world, yet this door was open, you know, God never promised to destroy the world again by uh, by flood. We, we know that's the case. Um, but God has still got promises ahead of us. And the, the promise is basically sanctuary in Jesus Christ. And uh, I think the greatest day yet to come is when the door of heaven is open, when Jesus comes back and uh, the rapture may take place for some of us. We, some of us might be in the grave, but that will be another day of uh, resurrection and hope that, We've got choices every day of our life, um, whether we get out of bed, whether we stay in bed, whether we have coffee or tea. Some choices are big, some choices are small. Uh, what what town we choose to live in, you know, what house we choose to um, buy or or rent, what food we eat and how much we eat. They are all choices that we actually make. Um, you know, what schools we send our children to, what subjects they have. These are all choices, but small choices make uh, big um, avenues in our life. So choices determine our destiny. So pausing and choosing correctly is very, very important. And I guess when you think about it, there's a knock on heaven's door. Jesus is saying, hold or stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, I will come and, uh, to dine with him and he with me. What an amazing invitation. So Jesus is standing at the door knocking, 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 preparing a place of habitation with the Lord. And so we as individuals can choose or choose not to accept that invitation to heaven's door knocking on our heart. And I just love the fact where I was last week, so many, I was going to say dozens, but probably hundreds of people responded to God's heart. Um, knock, 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 knock. And it wasn't like a debate. It, people knew deep within them that's the place that they should be running through into that door. So heaven is a door open for us, and we just need to wisely walk through that way. At the beginning of this year, I was praying, Lord, is, is there a scripture um, that I should be aware of uh, for this year's um, ministry and where things were going? And the Lord led me to 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 8 and 9, and it says this, for the present, I am staying right here in Ephesus for a huge door of opportunity for the good work has opened up for me 
And there's also mushroom and opposition. Uh, that's in the uh, New International Translation. So Paul was in um, Ephesus, but he had this invitation to go to Corinth. Uh, and as he prayed about it, the Lord was saying, no, 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 I want you to stay here. There's a huge door, not a small door, a huge door of opportunity uh, has opened up for good work and obviously the um, the expansion of the gospel. He also recognized there was a lot of opposition going on, but even in the face of opposition, he didn't run from it. He stayed there. And I don't know what's going on in your life, but I believe doors of opportunity are always opening for us. You know, in the case of Paul, he was domiciled, he was living at Ephesus at the time. But as we look, we see the seven churches in Revelation that John was writing letters to. Um, these were churches that uh, Paul was part of their church plant and uh, encouraging them to do what they were doing. He was also writing letters to uh, Corinth and Thessalonica and, and other places. But here this great beachhead in Ephesus was for the church to be expanded into the uh, into Asia Minor. And uh, probably looking back in hindsight, Paul would have said, I did the right thing. I could have gone to, Cor uh, to uh, Corinth, but no, here was a place I should have been staying. And sometimes we just run from adversity. We run from the challenge. But even in the face of difficulty, God has got an intentionality for us to be there. Um, and I don't know about you, but, you know, we make choices every day. But sometimes there's significant choices. I look back in my life and thinking, okay, what are those choices have been? And obviously, um, I've had opportunity to lead churches, our denomination, um, and the, uh, the apostolic church I was part of offered me choices, but we were led by the Holy Spirit to examine these churches, but each time the door was shut, we didn't respond to those. And, I, and the people were saying, this is a logical door, but just because it's a logical door opening doesn't mean to say it's a God door. And as we pray, you know, scriptures came through like, uh, let the word be a light unto your feet. And Chris would open up the word of God in the morning as, as a wife. And, you know, she would show me scriptures like Philip was head, uh, head south by the desert road. So we got in the car and we went down the desert road to an invitation for to uh, take over a church in Wellington, or lead a church in Wellington. And so we got in the car, Philip got in the car and headed south by the desert road. And I could hardly believe that those words are in the Bible and Acts 1. But we went down there and then God said, no, 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 I want you to head, head north. And that was a scripture out of Exodus. And but each day, God was giving us guidance and we were faithful to follow through. But 29 years ago, minding my own business, enjoying life, God was opening up a door for me and it, and it was flung open. It wasn't like prized open. It was a door that opened up. And I've shared this, this with um, you before. Many of you probably know the story, but um, at one o'clock I woke up and I had this dream. And, um, and in the dream, uh, Chris and I were in South Auckland and we popped in to see a friend of ours. And we didn't know whether they'd be home, but we parked the car and got out and we knocked on their, their front door and they opened the door and they said, oh, it's so good that you're here. Come on in. Um, and this is all in the dream, which I had very, very clear. And um, we went in and we sat down and they said, oh, we've just put the belly on. Would you like coffee or tea? And while that was happening, ginger nuts and Tim Tams and Mellow Puffs were being brought out and deposited on the coffee table. And a few minutes later, um, my friend leaned, leaned forward and he asked me this question. He said, I'm going overseas to do a leadership seminar. Would you like to come? And this is all in the dream. And I said, yes, I'm coming. I'm coming. And over his shoulder, uh, um, I could see a clock on the wall and it said seven minutes past three. Well, I had that dream three times in the week. And I knew God was actually speaking. Well, Ironically, um, two weeks later, Chris and I were in South Auckland. We'd just taken one of our dogs to a dog show in, uh, near Ardmore. And we thought, well, maybe Ken and Ray went around. Let's pop in and see if they're there. So we parked the car, got out. Long story short, knocked on the door. They said, great, come on in. We've been thinking about you. So we went upstairs and sat down. And they said, the billy's on. We're having coffee and tea. What would you like? And, um, well, the answer was obviously coffee. And then... Um, they leaned forward and I, I could lean forward and 
on the coffee table were ginger nuts and Tim Tams and Malapas. And uh, while this was going on, my friend Ken leant, leant forward and he said, Phil, I'm going overseas to do a leadership seminar. Would you like to come? And I said, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. And he just about jumped out of his seat, out of his socks, and because um, he didn't expect such a sudden response. But I'd actually looked over his shoulder and there was a clock on the wall and it said seven minutes past three. Very, very vivid. So he said, hey, there's a problem. There's two choices. And one choice is to go to Fiji. And I'm thinking, oh, Fiji, tropical palms, tropical water. Um, maybe I should start singing the Hallelujah Chorus now. And I said, what's the other opportunity? And he said, oh, that's Thailand. And I and that sh sent the shivers up my spine. I'm thinking Thailand, Bangkok, noisy, smelly, dirty, hot, uh, long way away. But I didn't know what choice to make what location to go. So I sat down with my pastor at the time and he said, Phil, I think it would be more beneficial for you to go to Thailand because you'll learn more about church and life and ministry by going to Thailand than by going to Fiji. And so long story short, that was uh, in April um, 1996, I departed on that trip. So literally 29 years ago, 28 years ago, um, a significant time in my life. Well, ironically, years later, obviously, uh, Len Butler was in the church and he talked about me going to the Pacific Island and Fiji. And and as a church, we've started, obviously, the ministry there. And I've been up to Fiji many times. So that door's open, opened up to us now as, a, as well. But at the time, God had moved me from working in um, corporate medical into missions and full-time mission. A significant door had opened up to me. The doors will always open up. And just because a door is opening up doesn't mean to say we should rush through it. Um, and I guess the greatest door we have in our life is actually responding to Jesus as he knocks on the door of our heart. You know, Jesus was um, saying this to his disciple and Matthew said, again, it would be easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter into the kingdom. Now, at that time, 29 years ago, 30 odd years ago, you know, I wasn't rich, but I was getting richer by the day. But the opportunity for me to respond to mission was there before me. As a decision that I'd ever, never, ever regret. You know, what is the eye of the camel? It's um, obviously, a, it's a figurative thing in Jerusalem. But it was in the, the walls of defense. There was a small um, rock entrance where only one person could go through. A camel couldn't get through there. Um, people with uh, shields and all that would find it very difficult to get in. That was a, a physical location. But Jesus was saying to his disciples, it's the same, come on, it's much easier to go to heaven. Um, it's not easy to get, come into heaven. And he, he elaborated further when he talked about narrow gates and wide gates. You know, the, the wide gate was obviously for um, destruction, where the mass of humanity is flooding that way. But there was also a narrow gate and that was basically a narrow gate to life. But sadly, we look at the world and the majority of people are ignoring God's plea for salvation. It's like a Noah's day. You know, the majority of people ignored the warnings of the sign and the signs of sight. But I think we just have to be conscious of what's going on around us. And we can coach, we can guide, we can um, encourage people to come. You know, the invitation from heaven is to come to the banquet. Most people will reject that, but still the invitation still has to go out. And we've got to be persistent in doing that. You know, the, the devil is still deceiving people. He has from day one, before day one, obviously in heaven, man was created. And he's always been challenging God's word. You know, he's whispering things like, uh, did God really say that? You know, he's questioning the truth of God. So Satan always is denying the truth of God. No, God doesn't really say that. He didn't say that at all. He's diluting, diluting the word of God and he's changing God's truth or challenging the truth. No, God doesn't actually say this. He says this, twisting, distorting things. And I think we're living in a world that's becoming darker and darker and more evil. Things are becoming more confusing. Yeah, there's more and more religions. I think someone said the other day there's 4,600 religions. So that narrow gate that Jesus is talking about you know, it was only a pinhole with all this deception that's going out there. You know, the devil 
you know, and John's gospel talks about being, about being a murderer right from the beginning. He doesn't stand for truth. There's no truth in him. He's the father of lies. And I guess as Christians, we are a neutralizing force to that. We don't have to accept those lies and we can stand up in the face of adversity and say, no, this is what God's word says. And wherever I've been in the, wor the world, uh, literally, when God's word is proclaimed, people gravitate to it. They're drawn to it because there's something wholesome. It, it, even in the face of um, deception, God's word is still there. It's, it's an anchor in the storm. You know, doors of temptation will come because that's the way the enemy will always operate. You know, you can have a better job with a bigger office. You've got better status. You can have a fancier title. Um, you can always have more money. You know, you can have all these better fringe benefits, all those things. And it doesn't say it's right or wrong because some of those things are legitimate. You know, seek you first the kingdom of God and all things will be added unto you. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And I believe I know so many Christian business people that are ordered by God. You know, that they've got the um, steps of a good man theology right. And as they've used their business, they've propelled the kingdom of God forward. Uh, that's gained greater, greater traction. So just because a door opens up doesn't mean to say we should walk through it. Um, we should be wise. We need to be praying what we should do and how we should respond. Um, the humble and a humble in heart will always, you know, get um, clear reception from God. I believe we just have to don't respond to the first opportunity. Sometimes we've got to pray about it and uh, be wise. There's so much deception in the world today. But friends, we have the good news. You know, God's word will always direct, it will always guide, it will always help, it will always provide the counsel we need, it will provide the timing we need. Satan is always going to come as a dece deceiver. Has God really said that? You know, the serpent has been craftier than any other animal. Um, you know, he's he comes alongside and twists and distorts, you know, um, making good things seem right uh, or bad and legit legitimizing things. And the way of the world has not changed. You know, a few years ago, Donald Trump uh, coined the word fake, new fake news. And most of us probably never realized what fake news was, but now it's m more real than the, you know, as I say, the, the spot on the end of your nose is right there. It's, um, there's so much deception. You know, the world media is taking some truth and twisting it and turning it inside out. And they cut and paste things. And even with uh, AI, artificial intelligence, the fake news and deception is going to get worse and worse and worse. And as a body of God's people, we have to be alert. We have to be wise, not just gullible and accepting everything we hear. We need to filter it. We need to filter it wisely. There's so much preached word online that a little bit of uh, leaven goes a long way. And I'll tell you what, there's some garbage coming through with Christian Christianity. I saw a, something flash up on the TV about a program called The Testament the other day. And, and I just couldn't even be bothered. It's sickening to think of this, this deception that's going on in the church that so many people will accept you know, and, and distort their thinking. The thing is, God's way ahead of us is always going to be there. It's going to be challenging. Doors will open up. We've been given the keys of the kingdom. But just think of the challenge of people like Noah, you know, never happened before to build an ark. What a door of opportunity for this man and his sons to actually to, to go through. And David, the door of opportunity to respond to Goliath, all the soldiers of um, Israel were basically sitting on their hands, not doing anything, ignoring the challenge. But David, irrespective of his, of his age or his experience, he rose to the challenge. Moses, you know, in the wilderness, God spoke to him. I want you to do something for me. To go to a nation and speak up and speak out. To set people free. I don't know where God's calling you to, to go to and, you know, what door to knock on or what challenges you've got ahead. But he picked up his staff, you know, and I believe we can pick up our Bible and we can face so many situations and see God turn up and uh, see miracles happen and I don't know about you, but I look to God for healing and miracles to take place. You know, last week I was away ministering. I don't know how many people, how many churches I was in. Um, 
probably 45 churches I was ministering in last week with all the seminar work and schools and hundreds, thousands of lives. Um, words of knowledge. You step out in faith and God shows up and shows off, um, does amazing things. Paul, go and get the flow. Someone that was criticizing what God was doing, he had revelation. He chose to shut the door and go through the right door. And he changed so much for the Gentiles. We know the story. Jonah, clear commission to go to Nineveh. Went in the wrong direction, said, oops, Lord, turned around. And obviously Nineveh, you know, the people listened and they responded. Now, I don't know what directives God's given you as an individual, and hopefully there will be many. But hopefully, you know, you're going to be responsive. You're going to be um, true to the task at hand. And I believe as we're faithful and listening to the Holy Spirit, those doors of opportunity will continue to open up. You know, it says this in Luke 11, 28. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and obey it. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and obey it. And in the face of a world that's so confusing, the word of God has been more, well, I was going to say, it's more important now than ever. It's always been important. But the word of God is like a caliper. You know, in whatever situation you've got, you know, use the word of God as a caliper to measure the uh, uh, the truth of the matter. It will guide you. It will help you. It will discern right and wrong. Uh, it will, will provide the timing that you need. Uh, it will provide you the counsel that you need. So I believe that we just have to come back to the word of God in actually making decisions uh, and also the timing. So easy just to go with the flow and get trapped. And I think the world is going to find the flow to evil has become so much easier. Um, and we just have to do the right thing. The thing is, obedience is critical. Obedience will open the doors. Um, C.S. Lewis, that wise author who wrote all those books, had been to Oxford University. You know, he said, you know, it's like when you make choices, it's like an a hallway in a house and it's got all these doors in and um, these doors might be open but it doesn't mean to say you should actually walk through them but he said disobedience or obedience is the key that opens every door you know so disobedience is not being obedient so we can cut the dis out we just have to be obedient the steps of a good man are ordered by the lord many of us will make mistakes in life uh, mistakes are like missed steps but even if we do make missteps or make mistakes we can get back on course those doors need to be walked through we just need to backtrack and go through the pathway that God's calling us to go through thing is God's continually calling people to himself you me many many people you know I think of Peter as a fisherman finding his own business and God called him you know, a man that would obviously deny God, but God still trusted in them, who the church was built on. Matthew, a tax collector, a man that just loved money. He was obviously greedy, um, but God saw, saw through that facade and he ca called a man um, who actually wrote one of the Gospels. Um, it was a guy called Thomas, and he was a real doubter. You know, even after the crucifixion, he wanted, he couldn't believe it. You know, he was a doubter, and I believe. Many people have doubt. We are faithless. We don't have faith. We are doubting, you know, but God still has his eyes on you. Simon, who was a zealot, he was very uh, political. He was aggressive. He was um, a cut and thrust sort of guy. But God used this political radical to change so much. There were people like John and James, brothers. They were very, very insecure. Um, they actually got their mother to go to Jesus and ask if he could sit on thrones next to him. You know, they didn't have the guts to go to Jesus and himself. And you know, he got the mother, so they were hiding behind his mother's skirts. But they were insecure. But even in insecurity, God calls and challenges and he positions people. And there was a guy called Bartholomew. He was one of the disciples. And the interesting thing is, we don't know much about him. You know, you know, we see what Peter and um, James and John got up to. But Bartholomew was a, a nobody. We don't hear anything about him. But even the nobodies, God calls. And he's still calling. 
And I guess as a church, we have challenges ahead of us, doors of opportunity have opened and the various areas of the world and the people that we have responding in global mission. And I just think wherever we've got people, whether in Romania or in the Middle East or Africa, India, uh, through Asia, God is continuing to open up doors, obviously into the Pacific. God is a God who always opens doors. So I finished this morning, I'm just going to um, just probably continue uh, continue to sign off with um, a prayer. But before I do that, I just want to ask three questions before we go into breakout groups and discuss things on our Zoom meeting this morning. And the first question is uh, very simple, very practical. What is What have been some of the significant doors in your life that God has opened up to you in the past? What are some of those significant doors that God has opened up to you in the past? It may have been a job. It may have been um, a course at university or going to Bible college. Um, it may have been a choice of church where you went to, and it could have changed so much for you and your family. Good question. Another question is, what new doors is God opening up to you? you know, because I believe God continues to open up doors for each of us. So what new doors is God opening up to you? Um, they will always open up. You know, some of those doors may be right, some of those may be wrong. So knowing about it is the third question. How do we know this is the right door? And as you've made decisions before, maybe you like to talk about how you knew that it was right, wrong. Or if it was wrong, how did you realise it was wrong and you actually made it right? So those are some questions that hopefully will be stimulating conversation for you. But just as I um, close off now, I'm just going to pray and ask God to direct our conversation. So this morning, Lord, we just thank you, Lord, that you are Lord of all, that you've opened the greatest door in history by sending Jesus, your son, into our planet. The stone has been rolled away, Lord, but you gave the keys of the kingdom to Peter and to your church, Lord. And I pray that you would cause us to be wise stewards, to use those keys of the kingdom wisely so we know what door to walk in and through and what not to walk through that you give us discernment and guidance, that you cause our spirit to be attentive, Lord, to your voice. Lord, that we would reject, would reject outright all the deception, all the confusion that the enemy would seek to, to bring in, cloud or distort or twist your words, Lord. Lord, that we would be hearers of your word and obeyers of your word. So we ask this for your precious name's sake. Amen. Amen.